Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, we spoke to Giles Wilson, who was the founding editor of the BBC News magazine and also the former features editor of the BBC News website. He's since left the BBC and gone on to become creative director of Harpoon Productions, which is an agency that creates digital content for brands. I interviewed Giles at a live event in London. Cassia was away, so it was just me. And we had a few issues uh, with the recording, so we apologise for uh, elements of the sound quality here. It does go with the territory with live events. Uh, But a really interesting conversation. I spoke to Giles about his long and distinguished career as an executive at the BBC, and in particular his tenure pioneering this sort of ambitious long-form storytelling for the corporation. Big pieces on Iceland and Greece uh, came up in the conversation. And we also talked about where this kind of work fits into the UK journalism landscape. And in fact, Giles's passion for long form and narrative journalism has led him to found a festival which celebrates that kind of, of, of journalism. It's actually running in London this weekend. That's the 27th and 28th of May. Uh, so please do look it up. It should be fascinating. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Giles, can you tell me first about your background and how you moved to doing these uh, more ambitious projects? Um, looking back on it, it, there was so much that happened in a very, very short time to make, um, to make the news website as big as it was. And we were just absolutely right in our strategy to publish as many stories as we could. Anything that was moving, we just wanted to publish, write a story about. That was the right thing to do because then anybody who came to the website knew that there's always something new to look at. That was quite a simple dynamic in those days. Um, that was in the late 90s. Um, and it was quite early on that I recognised that that was going to take the website so far. The news was what people were going to come for, and that's what they wanted from the BBC to do the news. But that could only be part of it. You know, it needed to have the equivalent of... Um, it, you know, the, the news was the bulletin, if you like, and it needed to have the rest of it, the, the, the kind of programme material in, in broadcast terms. So we started introducing features quite early on, 2002, 2003, and that eventually grew into the magazine section, which I was very proud of, and that was really an attempt to define a more engaging, a deeper read than you are going to get on uh, just from reading a three or four hundred word news article. Um, and it worked, you know, it worked pretty well. We, over a number of years, we built up an audience of maybe. 10 million readers a week. One thing we learnt pretty early on was that bylines counted for nothing. And it didn't matter who had written a piece. The only thing that mattered was the idea of the piece and how, interestingly, you could express that in the five or six words that you would use to promote it on the front page. You could have Clive James writing something, and if it looked boring, nobody, almost literally nobody would read it. But you, know, you could have somebody you've never heard of writing something, and uh, as long as you ex- expressed it well and you were selling it well, then you would get you know, literally a million people reading it on, on, on the day. So um, that was one thing that I learned. The next thing was uh, because, you, because you get a very... You know, the tools are much even better now than they were then, but um, you get a very clear idea of what it is people are clicking, what they're, what they're looking at, what they're staying with. And so we knew that actually you had to be clear right from the start what was the proposition of your article. Right from you know, the, the first conversations you would ever have about writing a piece, you had to know what is the proposition. You couldn't be, it couldn't be a story about something or other. You had to think, no, no, what is, what is this about? What is going to be the proposition for the reader that is going to make them click? Because it's just the simple dynamic of looking at stuff on a website is so different from turning a page and finding something that you hadn't expected on a page. So that made us, uh, that, you know, made us do a kind of a style of content which um, is kind of very direct, very upfront, um, and was, you know, was pretty successful. Lots of days features would have been the most popular stories on the website, even when there, was, you know, there were good news stories going on. You know, we don't like to mention, all right, we actually put a ban on mentioning um, mentioning Snowfall, but it was definitely, there was definitely a paradigm shift with Snowfall because that made you 
that made journalists think that there was an ambition here which could be expressed properly? For anyone who's not familiar with it, Snowfall was a big multimedia piece that the New York Times did a few years ago uh, that featured the integration of video and pictures and was a real watershed in the kind of notion of what could be done with uh, log format presentation online. It absolutely was, and I think for, for lots of people in the industry, because you realised that you could bring the same ambition to a piece that you could bring to a, a lavishly illustrated magazine article or even a broadcast. And, and it wasn't just the journalists who noticed, so the managers and the, the senior editors and the, the um, yeah, entrepreneurs, no, everybody noticed that suddenly text, it wasn't just a matter of text or video on a website, you could do interesting things which were going to be engaging for the reader. Now Chartbeat, I can't remember which came first, whether it's Snowfall or Chartbeat, but um, that's something the BBC uses. I mean, that's one of, a t one of a number of tools which does this, but it does show you how far people are scrolling on the page and how long they are spending on it. And um, so the BBC is clearly, you know, it's got everything going for it. The fact that we can focus on the, the content and not not we don't have to meet you know the, the kind of the page view metrics or the onward journey metrics that meant that we really could just focus on the engagement so how engaging how how much are people going to read this piece how much are they going to stay with it what what is going into this piece that is uh, attracting the reader's attention and are you putting stuff into it which is distracting them and if you are then get it out you know try and keep people as long as you can on your stories, and that is a that's a great measure of success. If that, if the publication that you're working for is in favour of engagement as the metric, then go with it. Because as a writer, as an editor, and a producer, that's really where you, that's really where you want to be. Uh, when did you do your first ambitious piece for the BBC? Well, the first we did was. Um, uh, I, and again, I'm hazy about the date. I'm sorry, but the first we did really ambitiously was the, the Reykjavik Confessions by Simon Cox, which was a, a brilliant story. And I, uh, it, it, I'll explain briefly what it was about. It was a, it was a, a crime story, really. Um, uh, some young people in the 70s in, in Iceland, there, there were a couple of murders, and these young people um, confessed to the murders. They hadn't done it. And... Very soon after they confessed, some of them realised, why did we confess? We never did that. And, but they still went to prison, and there's, there's, um, uh, you know, there's, be, there's been a long sort of period of, of, um, of inquiry about what happened then. There was kind of a delusion thing going on. Um, and so we told this as a proper crime story. And we told it very elegantly with uh, properly shot video and great audio, proper interviews, and we had the, we had, um, it was one of the first times that we used a tool, we used shorthand, which was a, a tool um, for doing this kind of immersive story really well with full page pictures and autoplay video and all the distractions of the web were kind of eliminated and just allowing the reader to get immersed in the story. And that was that was brilliant. That, was a, that, was, that changed attitudes within the BBC. Looking at the Reykjavik piece, I was struck in particular by the fact that it, it used a novelistic tone. Um, it didn't have a, a sort of billboard paragraph high up saying that this is a piece about a miscarriage of justice. I was wondering, was there a pushback uh, that you encountered either internally or externally when you're dealing with that? Not that I recall. Um, there, was, uh, there was an appetite for experimentation then, and we certainly pushed it and I wanted it to feel as as much like a crime novel as it could while remaining as true as it was. Um, so Simon did the job really well and um, I suspect we might hear more of it to come yet. What challenges do you face um with the sort of teamwork that goes into this kind of work. Looking at these pieces, I was struck at the end that they have, uh, they have lists of credits of you know, up to about 10 people. How do you go about uh, corralling or getting that number of people together to make it work? It definitely needs discipline. So there would have been, a, there would have been probably that many people involved, but that would have been a producer on the story, uh, 
Simon as the writer and um, uh, you know, a video journalist and, a, and, a, and, a, and an editor and a developer. So there would have been a number of people involved. But you're absolutely right. Getting that a, a team of that size and, and a, a story that's that's complex like that, getting all those bits working together is a real challenge. And we had to turn our traditional process on its head. So, you know, the, I, I have worked in places where I'm not proud of this, but I have worked in, in places where the, the dynamic is, you know, a reporter brings a story to the desk, or maybe you know, they, they're given a story, but they bring back some copy. And at some point, somebody thinks, well, how are we going to illustrate this? And usually, if that's the way you're going to do it on, on the web with a multimedia story, well, good luck, because it's not going to work. You're not going to have the right, uh, you know, the right bits of video, the right bits of audio, the right pictures, you know, the right source material, raw materials put into it. So we just had to turn it on its head and say, right, well, let's get all these people together at the start and work out how we're going to structure this story. What is the story from the start? And how, even at that stage, have some idea of the arc that you're going to be taking here. What are the, uh, the, the limitations of the platform, for instance? You know, what, is the, what is the filming opportunities? What are the, what's the media that we can have here? Who is going to be able to carry all those things in their head? Maybe it's the writer, perhaps it doesn't have to be the writer, it can be the editor or, if, or a producer figure. But somebody needs to have all those things and be a guiding, uh, a guiding influence on that story so that you can make sure that you're telling, you're, you're throwing the right bit of, dropping the right bit of video in at the right time. And not everybody gets it right even now. Sometimes you will find, and I suspect this is because of the dynamics, uh, you know, the economics of doing these reports, but... Uh, you will find that however elegantly a narrative is constructed, there'll be a bit of video dropped in, which then tells the whole story from beginning to end. So it's, you know, that is produced as a package probably to run on telly or to run elsewhere. Uh, but if you're expecting the reader to go through this and you're, you're with them, you know, the, the reader's with the writer, you know, following the story and the twist and the building suspense and then the whole thing is just kind of given away, then... Um, that's, you know, that's, that's a bit of a missed opportunity, really. It reminds me of, um, it reminds me of uh, those books where you get the, um, you, you get, you get the, the illustrations on glossy paper in the middle. And sometimes they give away, you know, they give away key points that you're not, you haven't got to yet. You, you read, you never, I can never read those, they read the captions on those illustrations. You've got to read those right at the end because... If you're in any way paying attention to the story, then the risk is you're just going to be given away. Were the people writing these kind of pieces uh, predominantly BBC staffers or, or were they external freelancers? Al almost completely BBC staff. Um, and that was, by, uh, that was by design, really. Um, partly because we realised soon after that this was, uh, this was challenging for... BBC people to do who have got many skills and are wonderful people but writing long text is not something many BBC journalists have been called to do or if they've done it it's you know at an earlier stage in their career so we wanted to um, use as many different members of staff as we could or or, or at least regular correspondents who, who as we could because we wanted to upskill people within the BBC to make them better able to write this kind of content. On the, the second story um, that we, we were looking at, the uh, one about China, what I was really struck here was, was how, you know, this is a story about a family in a town, but really it's a story of China as a country over the last 10 to 15 years, but also it's a piece of journalism that, that represents 10 to 15 years' work. So this is a, uh, you know, clearly the, the reporter was working on this for an incredibly long time. How did that come about? Yeah, it's, the story is called um, "The Village and the Girl," and it's a it's absolutely brilliant story. Carrie Gracie is an excellent reporter. She is really an excellent reporter, and she has stuck with this story about a, a village called White Horse Village, um, literally for yeah, ten years, twelve years, through um, uh, through various reporting stints that she's got there. She's China editor now. Um, and this was, this, was, this was 10 years after 
her first report of this village. And we knew we wanted to do something ambitious for it. I was, I was very clear, though, that we should do this in, a, um, in what I would now call a narrative style. But um, it shouldn't just be a piece about, here is my reporting over, this, over these lectures. We wanted to tell a story which would really bring this subject alive. And fortunately, she's such a good reporter that she did it really well. So she found, um, uh, in, her, in her early reporting, she had made friends with a, a, a woman who was, um, she was a, a young woman in those, uh, at that time, and she was very frustrated with her lot in life that her role was to look after the family pigs while her husband uh, went away to another city to work, to, raise mo to earn money for the family, and she was, she was frustrated with it. So there was a huge, pro a huge um, uh, urbanization of an industrialization of this very, what had been a very rural area. And her own story was as interesting as the story of the, uh, of the area, because by the end of it, she was a businesswoman. She was running her own company, which had municipal contracts with the, with the city authorities. Her husband had come back to the home city and now worked for her. And so it was just a great story, that, you know, telling the wider story about what had happened to China in a very short time through what had happened to her and how she, she had turned her own expectations upside down. It's, I mean, it's, it's a great piece, really good. I've got a, a stylistic question here that um, I was just looking at some of the, the pieces online and it seemed that they are, although written in, in quite flowing narrative prose, paginated in these, these short four-line paragraphs. Um, I was wondering if that's a deliberate thing or just a feature of how the BBC website looks. I, I, I don't think that was a deliberate creative thing. Um, I suspect that was really just a symptom of expectations of house style. I don't, I don't think there was, you know, we really talked about um, trying to do anything which looked, uh, uh, which asked much more of the reader than our, our normal copy, except in, except in the overall length and immersiveness. Where do you stand on going forward on narrative presentation for long form stuff? Do you see it uh, as following a snowfall model with uh, the visuals and the video and so forth or being more pared back as we go forward? I suspect less is going to be more, but I think it's all to do with the, it's all to do with the quality of the elements. Throwing things for the sake of it at stories is it, it, it's counterproductive. But having the right pieces in the right place can make a huge difference. So it, it goes back to the point that I made earlier, really, that you need you need in any team doing this kind of work, you need one brain, which is really across all this and is in charge of the storytelling. And that has everything has to, in my in my mind at least, has to be subject to that. To get real quality out of this, to get real engagement, then you need to have somebody who is saying that might be pretty, but it distracts. You know, it detracts from the piece. Let's get let's get rid of it. We want to focus on the story. On this final piece from Jeff Meishi, if that's the correct pronunciation of his name, um, about this extraordinary uh, crime story in Greece, how did that come about? Well, that was that was. Um, so Je Jeff Meish's piece, um, he's, he's written a few pieces for the BBC now. And he's got a film deal this week, I'm very pleased to report. He's a, he's a great reporter. He's, um, I hope people discover his work. He's, he's a great guy. Um, he, he came to me on spec with a story about a, a, a Greek bank robber who had, he had robbed banks on principle. This was, this was his shtick, that he'd, he'd, he'd robbed the banks and as he was fleeing the bank, he was throwing the money in the air to give it to the passers-by. And he was doing it really as a, as a way of settling scores with banks. And he was, he was sprung from prison twice in the same way by helicopter. Yeah. It's just I mean, it's an amazing story. So Jeff, Jeff brought this story and I looked at it and I thought, well, this, really? Really? I mean, this is just amazing. And, and I said, Jeff, do you, do you, you know, speak? Greek? And he said, no, no. Said, right, okay, because there's, there's a lot of detail in this story. And I was kind of like thinking... So had he written it? He brought it to me, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about writers doing work on spec? Do you see that there's um, a potential uh, benefits here for people to be able to get commissions at relatively early stages in their career? Or is it 
potentially disadvantageous that they're telegraphing that they place a, a relatively low value on their own work. Well, Jeff had spent six months on this, and he was, I mean, he was kind of new to it, um, but any, you know, any feeling I had about it at the time was wrong. So, uh, you know, I, 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 learned, I learned a huge amount from that piece, um, because I, I asked him a lot of questions about the piece. I said, no, you here, like, I don't know, here are 20 questions I've got about this piece. And in each of those cases, he could give me chapter and verse and source and recordings and uh, you know, absolutely backed up every assertion that he would. And it taught me a huge amount about uh, you know, how thorough really, really good narrative reporting needs to be. Long form narrative writing is often seen as an American sport. Uh, do you see the change happening with that? Will it be more accepted in Britain? And do you, how do you see the, the BBC's own policy to doing this stuff? I'm, I'm, so I'm not at the BBC now and I don't, I don't know quite what their, what their plans for this are. I don't know why this should be an American sport. There's no, there's no reason why British, uh, British long form and narrative journalism shouldn't be more celebrated than it is. I'm a, it's a bit of a mystery. I'm, I guess there are a number of theories as to why people don't like to talk about, you know, present company accepted, but why people don't generally like to talk about narrative journalism in the UK. Yeah. Um, you know, my own theory is that there's a, you know, it's a bit rum somehow to, to be seen to be taking it, taking it too seriously. Now, why is that? That's just mad. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And that can't, you know, that can't and shouldn't, uh, that shouldn't be the case. We should take this stuff seriously. It should be celebrated. When, when magazines, newspapers and digital operations have invested in journalism, as lots of them do in the UK, I mean, I'm not saying this work doesn't happen here because it absolutely does, but it's not celebrated in the way uh, it is either overtly by publications or within the community, the journalism community. Can you tell us a bit about the well-told conference you're organising on UK narrative journalism? So partly born out of that frustration, um, I, I decided to try and do something about that. Uh, so I'm setting up what I think is the UK's first conference in long form and narrative journalism, and it's happening in two months time, the end of May. Um, and uh, we're getting people from, some people coming over from America to help. We're getting some great journalists, podcasters, documentary makers to come and talk to other journalists, other writers, other people who are working in, in these industries to, uh, you know, to talk about what it is that makes their work stand out. Why, you know, what are their techniques? What are, their, um, what, you know, what are the pitfalls? What are the ethical challenges? What are the practical challenges? Um, and hopefully it can be the start of something that is going to be a, a, a movement which will value this kind of content more than we have been valuing it up till now. I hope that's, that's at least the intention. Um, and, you know, I think it has to be a good thing that at least people will maybe get to know each other a bit better and they'll get to share some experience and even among, even among journalists' peers to value it more. Well told it's going to be over two days. We've got a, we've got a Saturday afternoon when we're going to have a kind of a live event um, when we're going to be uh, showcasing some of the best of uh, British narrative and long form work. And on the Sunday, it's going to be, um, you know, in some ways, a more conventional conference approach to it. So we've got some keynote speakers and we've got some um, uh, you know, the breakout sessions dealing with some of those subjects that I've mentioned. Um, and we've got some great names coming, some more um, to be announced in the next couple of weeks. And as a final question, uh, the work that you're doing currently with Harpoon Productions, uh, what does that involve? Uh, what I enjoyed most about working at the BBC was assembling a team of people who could work together and um, you know, bring out the, the best of their work and, and uh, uh, you know, achieve really great things. And that's what I'm trying to do with Harpoon Productions. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a new digital indie a production agency and um, it's, uh, it's early days for it, but our, our intention is to be producing digital content for uh, whoever wants it, so for publishers and for, for brands and for anybody else, um, to bring together some of those skills. We're drawing a network of people who are very good at what they do and um, 
and uh, so the intention is to be able to deliver it in the same way we delivered it for the BBC. We hope you enjoyed that. A uh, quick update from us. Simon, what have you been up to? Uh, I had a busy week. I met my book deadline, which was good, at the end of the month. And then I was up in Scotland on Ben Nevis uh, with a bunch of bold, uh, slightly hair-raising Scottish skiers for this magazine piece. Uh, in terms of what I've been reading, uh, mostly court documents relating to the Alexander Blackman case for my book research. Cassia, what about you? I spent the week uh, with my sister. Uh, I'm trying to get through a period of, of writer's block so I've been <laughs> relegated to a shed at the bottom of her garden uh, Cassia, to get away from London distractions. Cassia loves sheds. She's, love a, shed. she's actually constructing one of her own in an undisclosed location in South London. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My back garden. Um, <laughs> and I was also preparing for a talk at the V&A and I've also got another one at Bath Festival later this month which is, uh, is terrifying because I'm not very good with um, PowerPoint slideshows but I'll have to get on top of that. Like all writers, we love feedback, so do please find us on social media. On Facebook, you can just search for us at Always Take Notes. On Twitter, we're at Take Notes Always. And we're also on Instagram. And if you've enjoyed the show, we'd love if you could leave a review on iTunes. That really helps. This episode of Always Take Notes was produced by Olivia Kralin, Ed Kiernan and Liz Davies. Music was by Jess Danheiser. And we've been your hosts, Simon Acom And Cassia Sinclair. Thank you so much for joining us and we can't wait to have you back with us next time. <laughs>